Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I'm so excited to have you all here today. We have a really great in-depth topic to cover, and I can't wait to dive in. While we give folks just a couple more minutes to hop on, I want to make sure that all our attendees for this webinar are able to use the question box feature in GoToWebinar. That's essentially going to be your chat feature for the day, and I'll be able to see your questions or your responses into that question box there. So if you all don't mind typing into that question box, let me know where you're calling in from today, and I'll shout out some of the answers. One of the beautiful things about these webinars is they connect folks from all different corners of the world to join us for this presentation today. For example, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm born and raised here. I love it. Um, and so I always love to see who, who we have on the call uh, for the webinar, who's calling in. So let's see, we have Tiffany. She said hello from Montreal. Hello, Tiffany. Kelly from St. Louis. Louis, hello, Kelly. Emily from Columbus, Ohio. Alan from Portland, Oregon. Isaac from Philly, welcome. Mark from Boston, welcome. We got Lisa from Memphis, Tennessee. Hello, Lisa. Marjorie from Rye, New Hampshire, welcome. Monica from Greenfield, Wisconsin, welcome. Jay from Toronto, hello, Jay. Will from Alberta, hello. Tons of folks calling in. Oh my gosh, there's so many responses. This is a, such a great feeling. I love to just see uh, where everyone is coming from. Someone said from Mars, love it, so funny. Karen's from Houston, Texas. Hey there, Karen. Lisa from Atlanta, Georgia. Hello there, Lisa. Kim from Ohio. Jennifer from Idaho. Cynthia from North Carolina. Siri from New York. Beautiful. So many folks calling in. Aaron from West Palm Beach. Hello. So many folks calling in. I wish I could call each and every one of you out, but thanks for doing that exercise for, for me. It's one great to just see who we have on the call today. It can kind of give a nice feeling when you're sitting alone, staring at your screen, knowing that there's tons of other folks in the same spot as you right now. So give yourselves a pat on the back for showing up today uh, for yourself, for your business, and for your digital marketing strategy. Um, so for everyone on this call, welcome. I can't wait to dive in. And with that being said, we're going to start off with a couple of housekeeping items. So as I had mentioned, it's great to all have you here today. Um, please note for this local IQ Word Stream Reach Local webinar, um, know that it will be recorded. So don't worry about taking any notes or anything like that. You'll have the materials in your inbox later today, along with a copy of the presentation. And again, the recording will be in there as well. Also, friendly reminder to everyone on this call, please know that all of our webinar recordings are easily found on the local IQ and WordStream YouTube channels. So if you hop on to YouTube and just do a quick search for local IQ or for WordStream, you'll be able to find our webinar recordings there as well. So if you ever wanna check out any of our past webinars, uh, definitely do so on there. So if for whatever reason later you can't find the recording, know that YouTube is always your go-to spot for those recordings. So again, friendly reminder that those recordings will be on the way. And also be sure to submit your questions. That's also why I had you all type in where you're from into the question box. I want you to feel comfortable using the question box throughout. I'll be able to look at your responses throughout and also be sure to stick around for the Q&A session and save some questions to put into that question box for the end of the presentation. If you've attended any of our past webinars, you know that we've done some really in-depth Q&A sessions. It's one of my favorite parts of doing these because it's basically uh, me as an expert representing uh, for our, our business um, and here to answer all of your questions, almost in like a one-on-one -on -one kind of feel. So it's a really great experience. I love to see the questions that come in. So definitely make sure that you're able to use those. Great. So for everyone on the call today, I want to get us on the same page as to who Local IQ is. Now, some of you might be already working with us, and that's wonderful. Some of you might be familiar with us, and that's great, too. Some of you might be totally new, also totally fine and okay. And some of you might be working with or familiar our, with our sister brands, Reach Local and WordStream. So for everyone on this call today, no matter where you are in your journey with us, 
I want us to all get on the same page again as to who Local IQ is. And essentially, Local IQ is a fully integrated growth marketing platform that basically marries unparalleled technology and expertise um, with the tools that you need um, at your fingertips to help your business thrive and prosper. Now, how exactly do we do that? So there's kind of three main pillars here. At our core is technology. Um, we have informed data algorithms that are basing their these data back decisions for your business in real time using over 1 million different local IQ campaigns. Um, so this is proprietary data that you can't find anywhere else in proprietary technology. Um, and then again, we also give you tools at your fingertips to save you time, to put more time back into your day to focus on things outside of marketing and making sure that your business is running smoothly. And then we also have proven results. So we've been in the digital marketing game for over 15 years, which if you think about the age of digital marketing, it's not much older than that. So we've really been there through it all, through the ebbs and flows and um, have seen the landscape change and evolve and have been able to kept, keep up with that and have proven results uh, through our client success stories over the years. So um, that's basically how we've built out this amazing platform for all of you to take advantage of. Um, one thing that I want you all to be aware of too that we're really proud of is that Local IQ is a premier partner with all the major advertising platforms. Now this isn't some type of accolade that's just given out to every business or platform or agency out there. It's only granted to platforms that maximize campaign success for businesses like you all, um, demonstrate clear and thought leadership and expertise, and also meet a rigorous set of requirements. So really excited and happy to show you all that we are a premier partner. Um, and that we are glad to work with these amazing platforms. A common question that I get on a lot of these webinars is where can you learn more about um, Local IQ and our sister brands, where to reach local? Where can you um, learn more about the topics that we discuss on these webinars? Uh, we, these webinars fly by, right? It's only an hour. So a lot of the topics that we cover, you can go really in depth to. Uh, so I highly recommend checking out our websites, the Local IQ and WordStream blogs, cover all of the topics that we cover in our webinar, super in depth. So if you wanna just take some time to sit with a couple of articles and really dig into some of the information here, I highly recommend just typing in our websites, checking us out. Uh, we have a ton of free resources and educational content on those sites um, to help kind of expand these webinar programs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. You can find Local IQ on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and WordStream on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. So if you wanna stay up to date on the latest and greatest from Local IQ WordStream, if you want to stay posted for future webinars, we post about those. If you wanna join more of these in future, if again, you want just more information on the topics that we cover here, we share interesting articles, um, information on platform updates, which advertisers should know, and so on. Uh, so definitely make sure you're following us um, just to stay in touch and kind of stay in the loop on what you need to know to help your business grow and thrive. Great, and a little intro to me. Hello, I'm your webinar host and speaker for today, and it's wonderful to meet you all. So my name is Susie. I'll be taking you along on this journey with us today for the next hour. Um, I'm a senior content marketing specialist at Local IQ, where I write educational content on everything under the digital marketing sun, from search ads to SEO to email marketing to display to literally anything and everything with marketing. I've written on it and studied it and researched it. So how I came into this role was I actually was formerly a digital marketing consultant over at WordStream. Um, and within this role, I was you know, working with businesses just like everyone on this call today and coaching them through the day-to-day -day best practices across platforms like Facebook ads, Google ads, and so on. So I took that real life experience of working with many different accounts of all shapes and sizes and applied it to the educational content that we create here at Local IQ and WordStream. As I had mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, a fun fact about me is I'm based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and I love it up here. A little unpopular opinion that I have is I love the winter time. It's my favorite season. I love to go snowboarding when I'm not at work on the weekends. Um, it's really great in Boston. We can just do a short drive up to the mountains out here. So really looking forward to the season and happy to see summer come to a close. And sorry for all of my summer lovers on the call today. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter if you'd like. I do post about interesting articles that I write on 
the WordStream and local IQ sites. I also share out information about our upcoming webinars and so on. So definitely um, check those out. All right, great. So we're just gonna go through our agenda for today. So we're going to, of course, touch on the search and benchmark data that we have here. We're also going to walk through um, our latest reports and we're going to give you real actionable tips to walk away with um, so that you can not only understand all of the data in our latest report, but also have some key takeaways that you can kind of walk away with and know what to do with all of that data. And then of course, we'll leave you with some thought starters and jump into the Q&A section. So before we jump into this amazing agenda here, I like to always keep all of my listeners on their toes. Um, so if you've attended any of the past webinars, you know I love to do this. I wanna just kind of pivot quickly to a quick pop quiz for you all, um, just to warm you up to the topic. I'd love to hear from everyone in this call now, type into the question box, you know, how do you feel like your search ads experience has been going so far? Do you feel like you've seen increases in your cost per click or cost per lead costs? Have you seen increases in your conversion rates? Have you been struggling with your click-through rate? You know, just a general sentiment on how your search ads have been performing, what your experience might be with search ads, whether you're totally new and unsure what to do, or maybe you've been running search ads for a while and crushing it. I always think that these types of little warm up pop quizzes that you can type into the question box are just a really great way to get everyone on the same page. So I'll call out some of the answers here. Matthew says that his search ads could be improved, definitely understandable. Isaac says that it's a little expensive. He's in a niche market, so it can be difficult to get those lower costs, definitely understandable. Brenda says her search ads are going very well, which is really great to see. Thank you, Brenda. Lisa says the search ads experience some, seems to be getting worse as of recently. Um, Shannon says always could use more conversions. I love that perspective, Shannon. When I was a consultant, you know, I always was in the mantra of there's always room for improvement in search ads, right? Um, Megan says she's seeing high level of traffic and click-through rate, but not as much um, results with other key metrics like possibly conversion rate um, or so on. Um, Han has said that she's found less conversions and it's been more expensive. Phil is not doing any search ads yet. Totally fine, Phil. Welcome to the call and welcome to folks of all levels. Uh, this webinar is friendly to folks of all different levels. Uh, Colleen said, agree with Brenda that the platform changes recently are making campaigns go bad. Definitely we can address some of that in the Q&A as well. Um, and I'm going to reference a lot the article that we've published um, with this report that you all can check out. We have some really great insights from experts uh, that dive into some of that as well. Cynthia says she's fairly new. Um, she's wondering how AI marketing like ChatGPT, BARD, and et cetera will affect search. I'll touch on that a little bit today as well. Um, and Matthew says search ads have been difficult with combined campaigns. Definitely understandable. Tons of different responses coming in here and I wish I could call every one of them out for the sake of time. We'll take a pause in this pop quiz exercise, but thank you all so much for participating in that. What I want you to all take away from that is, I don't know if you noticed, but every single answer that I called out was completely different from one another, right? Um, and the reason why I wanna highlight that is, I want you all to understand that your search ad situation is going to be unique. And we're going to see a lot of key industry benchmarks today. And I don't, I want you to, almost take it with a grain of salt and remember that you have your own unique account and your own unique business needs and your own unique situation. There is no two Google ads accounts that look exactly alike. Everyone's gonna see different results. So what might work for your competitor or the business next door might not work for you and that's okay. And it's totally okay that you're in a different spot in your search ad journey than the other listeners on this call. That's why I wanted to highlight all these different answers is because at the end of the day, we're going to talk through some benchmarks that you can use as guidelines. We'll talk through some best practices that can be applied to a more unique situation. But I want you to be keeping in mind and thinking back to, all right, well, how can these more general tips and ideas and these this more general data translate to my own unique strategy, my own unique needs? So really great exercise. Thank you all for hopping in on that. With that being said, we'll jump into the introduction to our data. So if you're familiar with the word stream and local IQ brands, which I hope you all are, and if not, again, welcome. 
we do publish these um, benchmark reports pretty regularly. And it's something we're really proud of because it's based on all of our own proprietary data. So this is information that you can't get anywhere else. And the metrics that we're going to walk through today are an average click-through rate, which is calculated by how many times your ad have seen, has been seen versus how many times it was actually clicked on. Average cost per click, which is of course out of all your total spend, um, divided by your total amount of clicks, so how much an individual click on average would cost your business. And then average conversion rate, again, how many times your ad is being clicked on versus how many times they're actually converting off that click. So again, kind of just connecting back to that bottom line for your business. And then of course, the money metric cost per lead, which is also known as cost per conversion, cost per acquisition, cost per action, you know, whatever you prefer to call it. My running joke is that they already had CPC taken with, but with cost per click, so they couldn't do cost per conversion. So now we call it cost per lead. But at the end of the day, it's basically gonna mean whatever is the meaningful action for your business. And I'll get into this a little bit later, but you know, while we say cost per lead here, if you're not a lead generating business, that's totally fine. This is basically your cost per action or cost per acquisition metric. So thinking purchases off your website, form fills, uh, phone calls, it really depends on what you wanna track as an action. Now we'll get into more of that later, but I just want you all to be familiar with the metrics that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and basically how we are pulling this data. So we looked at over 17,200 different US-based search campaigns. Um, it was about 80% Google and 20% Bing. So a little bit of both of the major ad platforms in there. Um, and for each of the 23 industries that we're gonna be highlighting in these reports, um, they had to have a minimum of 89 unique campaigns. Now this actually equates to many, many more different campaign cycles. So while it's, we're looking at over 17,200 campaigns. Each of those individual campaigns go through multiple cycles as well. So there's a ton, a ton, a ton of data to really crunch through here. Um, and we're looking through for the past um, year. So from uh, the beginning of Q, uh, from the beginning of April, 2022 through 2023 in March. So this is the most recent data that basically, you know, you can get your hands on out there. And all the um, data points that we're gonna be talking about today are medium figures. So they're technically medium figures to account for any outliers. And basically why we're publishing and releasing this report and wanting to walk through it with you all is to help you stay competitive by knowing what are the averages in your industry. And even if your account is way off from these benchmarks, from these averages, this can be your guiding light to kind of understanding, all right, am I killing it? Am I not doing so good and I need to adjust? You know you're always gonna be pivoting your strategy. So this can help with that. Also can help you plan your 2024 budget, which I know it's only August, but believe it or not, that's right around the corner. And again, things are ebbing and flowing. I even saw on the question box response in my pop quiz, you know, that we're all aware that there's tons of different softwares and technologies emerging, tons of different platform updates. So how can you navigate that and compete with this rapidly evolving landscape and economy? So let's go through some very high level um, key trends. And I'm just going to kind of touch on some of these and then we'll go more in depth here. So here are the baseline metrics across all industries. And again, this is probably way off from what you all are individually seeing in your accounts. And that's totally normal and okay because a lot of us on this call are probably in really specific industries as we had seen in some of these responses here. But I think it is helpful to kind of just know the lay of the land, right? And understand like, all right, at the end of the day, what is the average, you know, business, growing business, you know, maybe a small, medium-sized business, maybe a growing multi-location or any enterprise business, like what on average are they seeing here? And we saw across the board with all of the data that we crunched that the average click-through rate for 2023 in Google ads and Bing ads was 6.11% a $4.22 cost per click, a 7.04% conversion rate, and a $53.52 cost per lead or cost per conversion. Um, so I'll go into kind of how that has evolved year over year, but I just wanna kind of warm us up with just the overall averages. So let's kind of discuss some of the year over year changes here. So we basically, 
evolved all of the um, averages that you just saw into each individual metric and how it's changed with compared to our last reports from last year. So starting off with click-through rate, it has increased year over year for 21 out of the 23 industries we looked at. Um, so although the two industries that didn't see it, this um, increase was business services and industrial and commercial industries both saw decreases, it, these decreases aren't as significant as the increases that other in, uh, industries have faced. So we are seeing some just general slight increases in click-through rate overall. So I'm going to go again, go into individual industries in the next section of the webinar, but I want to call out a few other industries as I'm talking through this chart here. So just keep that in mind. Cost per click year over year has also increased for 14 industries, um, but it actually has decreased for eight industries. So it was it's kind of like good news and bad news here. So 14 industries are seeing higher costs per click, but eight industries have actually been saving money on click. Uh, one of those being apparel, fashion, and jewelry. Um, in fact, 61% of industries saw an increase and only 35% saw a decrease. Um, now, this isn't super su surprising given the data that we saw that cost per click increase throughout 2022. So while our last year's um, reports did report a general increase in cost per click overall, that seemed to have mellowed out in the last year. Conversion rate has decreased for most industries, unfortunately. In some cases, it did go down significantly. All but two industries saw a downturn in their conversion rate. Uh, the two industries that saw an upturn in their conversion rate were beauty and personal care, as well as education and instruction. So that basically ends up with 91% of the industries that we saw uh, seeing an increase in CPL, as well as a decrease in conversion rate. And then finally, of course, the money metric, Cost per lead has increased year over year for all but two industries. The two industries that saw a decrease in cost per lead were automotive sales and beauty and personal care. So this means that 91% of industries saw an increase in how much it costs them to acquire a lead through search ads. Now this trend does mirror our 2022 data, but our latest updates for 2023 that they show that the increases year over year have also slowed. So basically like kind of the overall takeaway here is the customer journey is going to is kind of pivoting and i'm going to reference that a lot right because we're seeing conversion rates go down cost per click and click through rate go up um so basically like people are being a little bit more selective um with their actions that they're taking with businesses and then also to kind of the main takeaway from some of those key trends is that the while we are continuing to see increases in costs whether it be cost per click or cost per lead that the increases have slowed or haven't been as aggressive as they have been in the past. So 2021 going through to 2022, we saw pretty aggressive increases in those money metrics. But looking back at this 2023 data, that has slowed down a bit. So while you still are seeing an increase in costs, it's not probably as drastic as you might have seen in years prior. Um, so it's kind of an interesting trend and we'll dig a little bit more into it as we go. So time for the moment you all have been waiting for. Let's dig into the charts, industry by industry. It's gonna be a really great conversation. Um, I want you all to know, I'm going to show uh, all of our charts and I want you to understand that it's gonna be a lot to take in on the screen and that's okay. Just friendly reminder that the recording will be available on the YouTube channels. So you can look that up there. You can pause the video, take a deeper lot dive. And also, I cannot stress enough that these reports are easily found on the WordStream and local IQ blogs. So, and they are also available as a downloadable PDF. And again, friendly reminder that you'll have a copy of the slides in your inbox later today. But what I, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because you're probably going to want to take a deeper dive into this at some point, take your time with it, kind of you know, sit and massage the data with your own, you know, screens a little bit and kind of check it out. But I am going to show all of the charts and it's, I'm going to sit on them for a little bit and talk through as much as I can so that you all have time to really take it in and look at your unique industry and individual industry. I'll call out the highs and lows with throughout the chart. So any highlighted industries I'll try and mention. If I don't mention your industry, that's probably because you're kind of in the middle of the pack and that's okay too. So again, friendly reminder, 
if these charts you know seem like a lot don't worry you can definitely take some more time with it outside of this but this is more for us to get the conversation going of what these trends are and if your business again is uh, kind of far off from the metrics that we're going to talk through don't worry again i'm going to talk about some overall trends some takeaways that you can do and help you pivot to match up to these benchmarks and with that being said we'll dive into some of the data here so starting off with click-through rate and i'll also talk a little bit about the individual metrics um, like what they mean for your account and so on I feel like click-through rate often gets kind of forgotten as like the little lone metric because at the end of the day, click-through rate doesn't always equate to like the bottom line for your business, right? I think for a lot of advertisers, they tend to overlook click-through rate because, you know, click-through rate, it doesn't, you know, again, connect back to, it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting a ton of conversions or you're saving a ton of money, but it can be really important and really telling at your overall account performance because guess what like getting a click from your ad to your landing page is half the battle to actually getting a conversion so click through rate can be very important you know you don't want to be just blasting your ad out there without people actually clicking on it it can also be really telling at the efficacy of your ads and your ad copy um, so basically a lot of account issues like also low conversion rates can connect back to click through rate if I have low conversion rates, I probably likely will have a low click-through rate too. Um, if I have a high click-through rate but low conversion rates, that means that something in my ad isn't connecting, right? So that means that people are clicking on my ad, but once they get there, something goes wrong. Either I'm not clear on the action that I want them to take, or they weren't ready, or I'm possibly hitting the wrong people at the wrong time. So again, it can be very telling. So you'll find that the industries with the lowest click-through rates are attorney and legal services at a 4.76 click-through rate. Um, home and home improvement had a 4.8% click-through rate and business services had a 5.11% click-through rate. On the higher side, the industries with the highest click-through rates were arts and entertainment at 11.78%, sports and recreation at 10.53%, and travel at 10.03%. So some highs and lows there, um, you know, we do have charts also in the post about, you know, year over year change for each individual industry, but I just thought it was kind of interesting to kind of see the highs and lows here, especially if you're keeping in mind the overall average of 6.11% across industries, like, for example, arts and entertainment is way higher than that. Um, but you might notice like the sales cycles that you would likely expect from these types of businesses. So attorneys and legal services, obviously that's a much longer sales cycle because a lot of people have a lot to consider um, before they actually make the jump to work with an attorney versus arts and entertainment, you know, that could be looking for movie tickets, which is a pretty easy um, action to convert on. So, and that's not necessarily easy, right? I'm sure there's plenty of businesses in the arts and entertainment industry that struggle with their click-through rates, but at the end of the day, that's a much shorter sales cycle. So consumers tend to be quicker with their decisions. All right, so moving on to the next kind of rate, and I wanted to pair the two these metrics together. It is out of order from how they are on the blog because I personally feel like kind of understanding the rates at which people are completing actions with your business in their search journey can really be telling at the other money metrics that we'll get into next. And I also didn't want to over prioritize those money metrics, right? I think a lot of, like I said, a lot of advertisers can get hung up on those, understandably so, because you have money going into your search ads. But at the end of the day, these other metrics can be much more telling into the efficacy of your strategy. So for uh, conversion rate, of course, is, you know, again, how much people are clicking versus how much they're actually converting. So again, if we're seeing higher or even average click-through rates, but not the conversion rates that we want, we need to start rethinking, you know, what is that experience for the user? Is my ad clear? Is the action clear? Is it easy to complete? Is it quick to complete? Is my landing page optimized? There's so much that can go into your conversion rates. Um, and so for conversion rates, the three industries with the lowest average conversion rates were apparel, fashion, and jewelry at 1.57% conversion rate, furniture retail at 2.57% conversion rate, and real estate at 2.8% conversion rates. And then the, on the brighter side, the three industries with the highest average conversion rates in 2023 were animals and pets at 13.4%, 
physicians and surgeons at 13.12%, and automotive and repair services and parts at 12.61%. And again, keeping in mind the overall average of 7.04%, those particular industries on the high end are definitely way higher than the average, right? So, and again, kind of looking at the average business model for these types of businesses, um, it's definitely interesting to see that, you know, there's higher conversion rates here. The other thing that I really want to touch on here is your conversion rate is almost up to you in a way, because it's dependent on what you consider a conversion, what you consider to count as an action, right? Because you could count a button click as a conversion you could count watching a video on your site as a conversion and yes those actions might not necessarily connect to the bottom line but for your business depending on the business model that could be meaningful right and so of course you know with those types of actions that could be potentially easier for a user to complete that's obviously going to inflate or drive up your conversion rates right so always be thinking about kind of like what your conversion tracking strategy is here so you could like game the system if you wanted, add in a ton more actions that you're tracking and, and essentially shoot up your conversion rates that way. Now, you don't have to do that. It's really going to come down to what your priorities are. If your priority number one is to boost your conversion rates, then I would be absolutely looking at the actions that I'm tracking and making sure that I'm you know hitting the right actions and hitting easy, easy to complete actions. But of course, for a lot of businesses, that's not always the case. But Keep that in mind because I think that's often just a fun little note about conversion rates that often gets forgotten. So next up is cost per click. So we're moving on to the money metrics here. Um, cost per click is, of course, you know, on average how much you're spending per click. Um, and of course, we love to fall to focus in on cost per click a lot because it can have a direct impact in your cost per lead. Now, keeping in the back of your head those other um, metrics that we just walked through, of course, your conversion rate and, you know, can offset your cost per lead. So even if you have a high cost per click, if you have a really high conversion rate at the same time, then you might be able to still offset that high cost per click for your cost per lead. Um, on the other hand, if you have a really high click through rate, um, you ideally want to shoot for a lower cost per click, of course, because you don't want to be spending a ton on all these clicks all day that are really pricey. Um, so it can be kind of a balancing act with cost per click, and we'll talk about that a little bit and can happy to answer any questions on that in Q&A. But just to highlight the industries that saw an increase in cost per click this year um, were some of the biggest ones were personal services that was up by 17.47%. It saw an increase in cost per click. Um, and some of these other industries also saw a bigger jump. Um, I will highlight that the highest cost per clicks were actually at attorneys and legal services at $9.21, dental and dental services at $6.69, and home and home improvement at $6.55. Um, on the opposite end, the industries with the lowest cost per click were arts and entertainment as well as real estate. They were both at $1.55, and then travel is close behind at $1.63. And keeping in mind that again, the average was $4.22. So again, the highs and lows are like way off from the overall average, right? So totally normal if your business is seeing a different cost here. Um, but I do think that's interesting that we did see some increases in certain industries. And also mind you again, like um, we did call out arts and entertainment and attorneys and legal services and some of these other um metrics so it's kind of good to see them all together and i'll show you all the metrics together at the end of this section but you know with attorneys and legal services also having um some of the lowest conversion rates um it also you're going to see a higher um cost per click um and also because i think google can realize and understand like those really high value queries are going to be worth more to your business so when you are matching up, you know, to a really high value query where it's really competitive and there's tons of other ads on the page, you know, those are the types of factors that can drive up your cost per click. So definitely really interesting to see some of the highs and lows here. And last, but of course not least, because I know this is everyone's favorite metric, um, cost per lead, right? So cost per lead is, of course, how much you're spending overall compared to how many conversions you're getting. 
Um, so this can be the money metric, as I love to say, for a lot of businesses. And understandably so, like I said, because you have money, you know, again, going into this strategy. However, again, I want to kind of make sure that when you're thinking about these metrics, you need to be thinking about your own unique needs, right? So if you're hitting the conversion rate numbers that you want, but your cost per lead is a little high, you might be willing to accept that and trade off for more conversions. Or on the end, other end, if you're seeing a high cost per lead, but the leads are more value to your business, they're really high quality, that can also be kind of a balancing act there as well. So to just highlight some of the highs and lows here, the industries with the highest cost per lead were um, career and employment at $132.95 for, uh, per lead, attorneys and legal services at $111.05 per lead, and furniture at $108.85 per lead. Now on the opposite end, the average, the industries with the lowest cost per lead were automotive and repair services and parts at $21.12, animals and pets at $23.57, and shopping collectibles and gifts at $31.50. So overall, um, the average was $53.52. Uh, so $53 just about was the overall average for cost per lead across all industries. So I would say not as huge of a difference from the lower end to higher end, I don't think. But again, thinking about the sales cycles here and the value that these conversions can equate to for some of these industries, it kind of makes sense that these trends are following this route. So for the sake of time, we're going to move on to just all of the metrics all together. I do want you all to just get a view, um, you know, find your industry in here and kind of just see the trends overall. And again, you'll kind of notice like the trends based on the business type. So again, attorney and legal services tends to have a higher cost per click and inherently is going to have a higher cost per lead. And then inherently those click-through rates are going to be a little bit lower. Also, that's going to be driving up those costs. And then conversion rates was just about middle of the pack. Now that's just one example. Um, again, I know we're all in very unique and different industries in here, but just kind of, I want you all to get into the rhythm of following that trend and thinking about the customer journey and thinking about, well, why is that? It's not just that costs are rising, right? It's not just that Google's charging us more because it wants to charge us more. You know, um, it's more of like a much bigger picture about, you know, the customer journey, the value to your business, the value that your business is providing to search users um, and so on. So we'll kind of talk about that as well. So with that said, I'm going to move on. I hope you all got to dig into these charts here. But again, if you need more time with them, that's more than understandable. It's a lot of data. Um, again, be sure to keep your eyes peeled for the recording and the information in your inbox later today. So how can you take action on all this data that I just dug into? So we kind of round up like a few key takeaways as to what this data means for, for most advertisers out there. So at the end of the day, you're gonna want to be flexible with your budgeting. We saw that costs were kind of all over the place and they're increasing in general overall and your unique costs might be different from these benchmarks. So, and I found when I've been working with you know, businesses for many years now, a lot of them, of course, you know, it's fine to have kind of like at the end of the day, this is annually or monthly, like my cap, this is my max, I can't spend more than this. I, I get that. I mean more being agile. I know it's not always feasible to just dump more budget into a campaign, but just having that mindset of you're not married to one set daily budget on a specific campaign, or you're not married to one specific uh, you know, bottom line costs that you want to hit every day or something like that. You know, be ready to pivot your budgets um, and use spend tracking tools as you go so you can add or take away budget as you go. Um, so, for example, the local IQ marketing dashboard does give you a pretty good insight into your spend tracking and your um, spend per um, for each strategy. So definitely want to check that out. Um, but again, just kind of being agile with those budgets is really important. And if I haven't highlighted it enough, I just want you all to know that your search journey is rapidly changing. So hold on, let me just fix that for you so that you can see. But basically I want you all to consider how your Google Ads strategy could be integrated into all possible touch points with your customers. So again, basically saying, think about all of these different spots that your business could be showing. Again, we have, um, 
the, the search journey is just jumping around like crazy, right? We're not just hopping onto the computer, our desktop and searching anymore. We're on our phones all day. We might see a business on social media and then search for them later. We might be, you know, talking to our personal devices at home, Alexa, Google Home, whatever it might be. Um, so thinking about how that search journey is changing, how people are exposed to your business outside of search ads can really help nail in your search ad strategy. And again, what I'm trying to say here is um, you want to kind of provide a consistent experience as well. So if I know that I am killing it at my social presence, but my search ads are lacking, then I need to be, you know, kind of generating more of that curiosity with my social presence so that people are hopping to the search bar and searching for my business later. And when they are searching for my business later, does what I portray through my search ads match what I'm portraying in my social ads so that there's a consistent experience. They recognize my business right away. They know what I'm offering. They know what to expect. And that's basically what consumers are going to be looking for now. Um, of course, there's plenty of different customers that are at different steps of the journey, but they're probably going to be searching throughout every step of that. So kind of thinking about what you can offer. Maybe you have a few different search campaigns that offer different things for different people at different stages of the funnel um, that are searching different things. So again, using the example of like um, an entertainment business, maybe I'm a movie theater, a multi-location movie theater, um, and I have a few different locations and I want people to be searching to buy movie tickets. Um, I might be thinking about, you know, who is going to be generally interested in these movies. So, you know, I might put in a few of the trending movies as keywords, for example, um, and then put in some specific ads that are for people that are thinking about going to the movie theater and talk about all the great things that are, you know, my movie theater has to offer to kind of rope them in to want to actually come and buy a ticket. Now for people more down the funnel that are searching more transactional terms, like where to buy, you know, movie tickets tonight. Of course, that type of keyword is a little bit lower in the funnel um, or further along in the customer journey. So I might want to have a different ad that serves, you know, has more calls to action, buy now, shop online, purchase here, those types of ads, which can be um, more effective for types of audiences further down the funnel. So it's no longer just kind of like, you know, a one trick pony with search ads. You kind of want to just have a few different campaigns, a few different search ads that fit a variety of different customer needs. Um, speaking of your ads and how they entice people to want to click on them, um, the highly clickable ads are definitely a thing that we're seeing overall. Of course, we saw a trend of cost uh, click through rates um, increasing for some industries while we did see decreases in others. but some folks had also mentioned this in the questions of how they think like chat GPT and generative AI um, searches can impact the search ad space. Think about that when you're creating your search ads now, right? So basically look at this screenshot of the search ad SERP or the search ad engine results page um, over here on the right. Back in the day, ads were highlighted in like yellow, if you all remember, with this really ugly ad box. They looked ugly and they were very hard to miss, even if you're not in the industry like me or you all, right? But now with this very subtle little sponsored um, snippet here at the top of ads, it can be very hard to the untrained or naked eye or average consumer to understand whether they're clicking on an ad or an organic result that can work in your favor, right? Because again, the typical consumer that doesn't have all the insights into search ads like we do, tend to be more apprehensive of clicking on ads. So lean into the fact that ads um, have so much more that you can put into them, um, aside from just like your average headlines and descriptions for your search ads, um, that you can make them more clickable and more enticing. So for example, we have new ad assets, as we even see in this example here with the screenshots of the products, you know, adding images onto your search ads is a thing now. Um, you know, leveraging resources or tools, a platform like us to help you write your copy and ensure that you're doing, you know, great creative and great images for these assets is another thing you can do. Um, so just always be thinking about the quality of your ads, I think is really important since it is getting so competitive, um, you really wanna be standing out on that SERP. Great, and then tracking and reporting, lastly, are so crucial to your account and your campaign. So 
Um, always be thinking about your structure when you're thinking about how you're going to track the efficacy and measure success of your search ads. So this kind of connects back to what I was insinuating when I was talking about conversion rates and how those can be impacted based on your conversion tracking strategy. Also be thinking about how you're going to structure your account to, um, again, better make the most sense out of what is going to be important for your business. So you really need to have your tracking tightened up, especially because a lot of people are probably going to be hopping onto your search ads or searching and then coming back to your business later. Um, or maybe they're going through other channels to finally end, you know, make that end conversion, but it started with a search ad. So you really want to make sure that your conversion tracking is buttoned up, that you have, you know, unique goals and um, actions that you're trying to have people complete with different unique campaigns, and that you have a very clear structure that makes sense to you and your business. You never want to be guessing about, you know, what a certain campaign is promoting. You want to have that unique, personalized ad copy for each different person in the different customer um, journey steps. So thinking about that when you structure out your account can really make all the difference. Great. So finally kind of wrap, wrapping up here. So to unlock search ad expense success in, for the rest of 2023 and into 2024, basically you want to be always thinking about how you can future-proof your account. If there was one takeaway from all of this data here, it was that the search ad landscape is constantly changing and how you structure your account and the campaign types that you choose to use can make a direct impact on your success. So if there are new campaign types, new um, features that you haven't taken advantage yet, like for example, ad assets, definitely do that. You know, try and embrace a lot of these platform updates so that you can get ahead of the game and stay ahead of your competition. Also, I know I preach this a lot if you've attended any of our past webinars, but definitely, like I had mentioned with budgeting, but just in general with your strategy, be flexible. The search ad landscape is constantly changing, so keep an open mind. Don't be afraid, like I said, to try new features, but also know when you need to pivot, right? So again, another experience that I've had with working with accounts over the years is, you know, I've seen businesses, especially now at this point in this landscape with the search ads, is that businesses might like really have expected a certain type of campaign to work. Maybe it's worked for them in a pat in the past. Maybe that specific offer was at one point their most popular offer, whatever it may be. And they want to ride that campaign into the sunset until that it brings in the results that they want. But sometimes you know, those types of campaigns just don't work well for the structure of their account or for their audience or for the current landscape. So even if a campaign did once work well, or you really, really expected it to work well and it didn't, that's okay. I want you to embrace that and always have, you know, that ability to be agile and switch to a different campaign type or switch to a different offer or strategy when that happens. Um, kind of understanding and knowing that it's okay to switch up your strategy is totally fine. Now, I'm not saying you need to absolutely roll out new campaigns every day or you need to switch your strategy every month. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, you need to give the platforms time to collect data and to make data back decisions for your business. But, you know, if you've been trying something for a really hard long time and you feel like you're just hitting a wall, that's normal and that's OK. And it's just time to switch to a different strategy. And also, again, I kind of insinuated this with, you know, what I had just said, but making sure that you're pacing yourself. So always be thinking about, well, what does success look like to me? There were a lot of metrics that I covered here outside of cost per lead, right? So even though that everybody kind of gets hung up on the money metrics of, you know, return on ad spend or cost per lead or whatever it may be, you know, it might take you to take a step back and, you know, think about, all right, really, what are the end goals? What is my, what is the primary metric that I want to prioritize for this campaign or this account? It doesn't always have to be, you know, cost per lead or return on ad spend. If it is, great, but it makes sure that it makes sense for your business and where you are in your journey. For example, if you want to really have a high conversion rate, you want to increase sales, but you're not yet driving enough clicks or traffic to your website, then you're probably gonna just set yourself up for failure because you're shooting for a metric that you're just not ready for yet. So you would be, it would be beneficial to focus more on just driving traffic from your ads and eventually the conversions will come down the line. So just kind of setting yourself up for success, keeping those expectations realistic along the way and tracking as you go can really help you understand 
you know, as the, all those search ads, you can kind of just turn on the faucet with that budget and just see the leads and the clicks coming in. It is at the end of the day, like with anything in marketing, a long-term game. So you're going to see some ebbs and flows in your performance year over year, and that's totally normal and fine. But just again, always make sure that you have a backup plan in place and that you're ready to pivot. Um, if there's one takeaway that I always say to folks on all of these webinars, is always, always have a backup plan. You know, if this campaign works out great, great. What am I going to do next to even maximize it even more? Or if this campaign doesn't work out how I anticipated it to, well, what am I going to do to pivot? Um, always thinking ahead like that can really help you um, see the most success on search ads and Microsoft ads. Okay, great. I'm seeing a ton of questions coming in, which is awesome. So with that being said, I'm going to launch a quick poll here. So going to go ahead and launch this on your screen. It's going to take over your whole screen. Um, and we're going to switch into the audio portion of the webinar. So please know that this poll is going to stay on your screen for the entirety of the remainder of, remainder of the webinar. And where you can just sit back and listen in on the um, Q&A session here. But basically, if you, I know that I covered a lot of information here today. I know this was a ton. I mean, I've been in the marketing game a long time and even I feel like this was a lot. So if you feel like you have more questions, um, you have questions unique to your specific business, which I definitely saw a lot of those coming into the question box. Um, definitely hit yes on that poll so that you can speak to someone one-on-one -on -one separately and get your specific answers, question, questions answered. You know, obviously I don't have the ability to give you all individualized advice right here today, which I wish I could. So that's why we're giving you the opportunity to do this, um, of course, after the call. Um, with that said, I'm going to switch into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So like I said, just sit back, relax, listen in after you've answered that poll while I go through our questions. And if you haven't yet submitted your questions, be sure to do so. Um, so let's see, tons of questions coming in. Um, Lisa asked, and I saw this come in when I was on that slide, Lisa, um, when I had shown the you know, sample Google Ads campaign structure, when I was talking about how much your structure can impact the um, results that you get from these metrics, um, there was in that structure, which is often suggested in a lot of our campaign and account structure content, why not more, no more than 20 keywords per ad group? This is a great question, Lisa. So as I had mentioned at the beginning of the call, a lot of the guidelines and benchmarks that I walked through today are suggestions, right? So why we suggest 20 keywords per ad group, which this can obviously change per, you know, different accounts, is basically you don't, I've seen accounts that have hundreds, hundreds of keywords in an ad group, right? And that makes zero sense for your average business that's, you know, managing Google ads on top of everything else. If you have time to filter through a hundred different keywords and, you know, pause them and put them on the right match type and so on, good for you. But at the end of the day, you probably don't even need that many anymore due to the emerging evolving technologies of the Google algorithm, right? It's even more so now you can get away with even way less keywords than you once could because of things like the rule of close variance, right? And the different matching behaviors that have been updated. So Google is making more contextual inferences based on searches to kind of match your ad up. So you can get away with a lot less keywords. Less keywords helps you focus in on the core money-making terms for your business, makes management easier, and again, can kind of help you keep that in control. If you're dumping you know, tons and tons of you know, 40, 50, 100 keywords into one ad group, that's usually a sign that you need to break that ad group out into multiple different ad groups so that you're, you're kind of just dumping it all together when you could probably break those up even more to have even more hyper-targeted ads. So again, just a guideline. If I'm not saying if you have exactly 20, um, you know, you're going to see success or not see success, but that was more just a guideline to help folks know that they can kind of manage their number of keywords that way. Great questions here. And someone else just asked in here, thoughts on SCAGs. So single keyword ad groups or SCAGs, it's kind of like the opposite of what I was just talking about. SCAGs kind of the same thing, right? In, in, in the opposite sense. When you're doing one single keyword in an ad group, that keyword better be your money keyword, right? And if it's not, you're probably not going to see the results that you ideally want. Not only that, 
but that also just rolls in a whole no, uh, other snowball effect of a ton of ad groups in your campaigns. And if you have that many ad groups in your campaigns, that's probably a sign that you need to regroup and reassign because again, that's just gonna make management a nightmare. Okay, great questions here. So tons more coming in, keep those questions coming. I'm sorting through all of them now. Let's see. Okay, Rob had asked, you your prior published studies cite very high conversion rates. I'm guessing they include micro conversions and not the final lead of sale. Do you have reports distinguishing the kind of conversions in your reported rate? Um, okay, so for the purpose of the reports, it is true leads. So we, when we're tracking leads here, that's what we're tracking. So those conversion rates, um, are equivalent to what you would typically see in an account. Um, let's see. Vanessa asks, campaigns are always worse after incorporating the recommendations from the Google experts call. Um, definitely that can be an uphill battle with the Google experts and what Google in the account might recommend. I know we all get the optimization recommendations on campaigns. Um, I would definitely take them with a grain of salt I think to be fair, a lot of the quote unquote recommendations potentially from like a Google um, support expert or you know that are promoted within the platform through like the recommendation and optimization sections can often be um, for generalized um, because of course Google is not a person like you or me. It's not thinking through the suggestions to the context of your business. Um, so that's why as tempting as it might be to take the suggestions, you kind of have to think about like what you what else you might need to see the success of that suggestion. So, for example, um, smart bidding is used best with broad match keywords. So, if Google is suggesting in your account that you use smart bidding, but you're not leveraging smart uh, broad match keywords, you're probably not going to see the success the success that you ideally would be hoping for. And of course, you know I'm not expecting everyone to know that. You would you kind of learn that as you go. Um, and that's why we're here, right? So we're here to help you understand and know these things, we're the experts in it, um, because it can be hard to kind of know those small little intricacies within that platform. Great questions here. Now we have just coming up on time here, so I'm gonna try and answer one or two more questions. Miranda asked, great question, Miranda, because of recent, key recent keyword changes, what match type do you recommend using? So this can vary from expert to expert so i will say like with anything in ppc pay-per-click advertising or marketing in general there is no right or wrong answer there is no end all be all like right strategy for everyone out there right so i will preface with that um I, if it was that easy of course we all wouldn't be here today right so what i will say is through my own personal experience if you're unsure of which match type to try there's two things you can do you can either try a little of each match type and test and see which one brings you the results, or you can try the one that seems to make the most sense for your unique situation. Usually that's gonna be the Goldilocks, quote unquote, uh, match type of phrase match, right? Because phrase match is a happy medium between the super restrictive exact match and the super loose uh, broad match. Now, so I tend to suggest to folks that they have no idea, you know, you can try it out on phrase match. However, with broad match coming into the picture and really being beefed up in the past uh, year from Google, it's also a very effective match type. And then, of course, there's businesses out there that are seeing success with exact match as well. So probably your best bet to um, test a few, but usually if you're unsure, the happy medium is phrase. And then if you feel like you're getting based on your search terms report, you know, if you feel like you're getting irrelevant traffic or not enough tra traffic, you can uh, restrict or expand your match type from there. So great questions, everyone. I wish I could answer all of your questions. This was great. Um, of course, as you can tell, I could talk about this all day. Um, but if you if you have more questions, like we said, that's why we have the poll up here. If you need anything else, you know, that's why we're all here. Be sure to keep your eyes out for recording. Keep your eyes out for more webinars to come. We do them monthly. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope you all got to dig into the data, feel like you learned something here. Thank you all, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks.